Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you, Rodney and Linda, for leading us. You can bring your mat. And it's, it's a, uh, well, what a privilege, be, a privilege uh, to be able to serve with you this morning. And here we are, the last Sunday of 2020, and it is a thrill and an honor and a privilege, as I say every time I get to an opportunity to present a message, uh, to be able to end the year this way. I wish we were together. I wish we were here face to face singing and building each other up, but we're not. A few weeks ago, I got a phone call from a friend of mine, actually a, a mentor, a boss I used to work with. And I hadn't talked to him in many years, and he has this kind of this southern draw, and he called me up and he goes, and the first thing he said was, Lance, how goes the battle? <laughs> and that was accurate. Is, has it not been a battle this year? You know, I was looking up stories, uh, news stories, top news stories, December 27th, 2019. It was really hard to find things, especially here locally. I, I looked up some things and I saw that, I, if I understand it right, the, library, the Philadelphia library system absolved every one of their fines on this date uh, one year ago. Uh, Sports-wise, I think the Sixers were playing the Magic tonight. Uh, I know that the Eagles had uh, quarterback number 11 throwing to a practice squad, 4,000 yards, carrying the team on his back into the playoffs, and now – year later, you may be taking another team to the playoffs. We don't know. I tried to look up stories on COVID-19. There were not that many. It was barely even mentioned on the news, even nationally, internationally. In fact, we didn't have our first official case of COVID-19 in the United States till around January 20th. And we didn't have any cases here in Pennsylvania, you know, official, officially till late February. And they were just presumptive cases that they were investigating. So many things can change in a year, right? I tell you, if it's one thing we have learned over and over again in 2020 is the certainty of uncertainty. You think about where we were a year ago and now look at the things that we're facing now. I don't think there's one person I know or you know that has not been affected in some way emotionally, spiritually, physically from this pandemic and the other events of, of 2020. It has been a battle and a struggle. And yet, as Christians, we know, we know inherently there is a rock that we can build on, the rock of Christ Jesus, our Savior. And yet, even then, when we know that, we know that there's still a struggle to find peace in that foundation. As, as Rodney mentioned just a, a, a few minutes ago, those without Christ, how, how do they do it? How do they live without this foundation? People are searching for a rock, something. Give me something this year. Maybe 21 will give us something to be certain. Yet we know that our foundation is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our passage of Scripture this morning that we're going to read together is Psalms 91. And it talks about the rock and the foundation. And there are certain themes that come from the Scripture that give, that give us great comfort. Themes of shelter and security and, and peace and prosperity and assurance and salvation. We'll read these together. Psalms 91 is one of those praise psalms. You know, the last time we were together and I spoke is uh, first Sunday of Advent. And we talked about lament psalms. And there's different types of psalms. And different authors of the psalms that are compiled together in the psalm book. And there, no one really knows who wrote this particular psalm. Probably a, some scholars say it was a, a, a Levite priest or something that just, you know, put this together for the congregation to sing together. And that's the key thing that we got to remember about the psalms. We read these sometimes as individuals. They were meant to be shared together and sung together as a community building each other up. And so let's hear this passage from Psalms 91, the psalm. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be, be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you say... The Lord is my refuge. 
and you make the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. And with long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Let's pray together as we get into the scripture. Lord, we are so thankful for the Psalms and the way they speak to our heart. We're thankful for the spirit that awakens our heart to see the riches of your glorious grace. We ask that through this message today that we will grow closer in likeness to you and that we would become even more aware of your great mercy and grace for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As a boy, I grew up in a, a church that sang a cappella music. And there was always these four-part harmonies that you would hear in the church. And it didn't matter. I, I learned growing up that about 2% of the world's population is tone deaf. You can learn how to sing different harmonies. I, I saw this growing up. And there's one particular song I remember. And that was, On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is, is sinking sand. I remember standing with my dad, who was a, a preacher. And as he would, sometimes as he would get up to preach, I could hear him singing this song, belting out. He had a tenor, baritone voice, and he would just belt out this song, especially that last verse. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. It was just a really powerful moment. The man who wrote that song was a, a Baptist pastor in the mid-1800s. His name was Edward Moat, and he was singing, you know, coming up with these uh, verses to try to describe the gracious nature of Christian living and trying to explain this to the children as well. And uh, he was coming up with these verses. The, the verses kind of came to him on the way to visit some parishioners in his church. And so he came to this house, and the wife was gravely ill, and he went inside, prayed with the husband and the wife, and the custom was that, they, that you would pray with the family and that a hymn would be sung. And so the husband turned to the pastor and said, uh, I don't even have any hymn books. Do you have a hymn book? I don't have any. And the pastor said, well, I have some words I've written down, and maybe we can sing them together. And so they sing the verses to that song. And when the wife heard those words, her spirit was revitalized, and she had great strength. And she stood up, she said, I've got, she sat up, she said, I've got to get the words for that song. And so the pastor went home and he wrote these words, and that's the song that we have today. You know, 200, 150, 200 years ago, you know, that, that, uh, that, that song really rings true, doesn't it? I mean, on Christ, it, it really, the, the words really touch our heart. This is the, the solid walk in which we stand. And in fact, it's kind of like the psalm that we just read. We think, picture this psalm being sung by shepherds in the field together by tradesmen at work, by families coming together in the synagogue singing this song about the rock and the fortress in their salvation. You know, because Christ is the rock of our salvation, because he is the rock in which we stand, we can find our security in his foundation that he provides for us. In fact, there's several themes that come up, and we'll be looking at just a few of these this morning. Because Christ is the rock on which we stand, we can find safety and shelter we can find assurance in salvation we can find prosperity in his promises well, as we look at the first part of the psalm we can see that there is great safety in the shelter in fact that's one of the first things we read here verses one through four we see these pictures that we can take with us of great shelter there's the idea of shelter itself in verse one he is my refuge he is my fortress a great a great city that cannot be taken uh, he protects me uh, underneath his wing. These are pictures of shelter. My boys and I, and Lisa as well, we, we enjoy watching a show called Bear Grylls Survival School. You know, there's Man vs. Wild, and, and there's you know, he, he's created a great series. And one of this is called Bear Grylls Survival School. And what he does is he takes children from the London suburbs, and he takes them out into the wilderness of, of the mountains of Wales, 
and he says, can they do it? Can they get away from their phones? I can't get his accent right, I'll stop. But can they get away from their phones? Can they, do they have what it takes to make it out here? And he gets them out there, and, the, and these are like, you know, 12, 13, 14-year-old kids, and the first thing he says every time is, find your shelter first. You know, it's tempting to go and make a fire. It's tempting to panic and start tr trying to collect food and trying to find water and, and, and panic and wonder where you are. He says, don't do that. First thing. Find shelter. Why? Because in shelter, there's safety. And once you feel safe, then you can go out and find food and scavenge and get water, find out where you are and take the next step. So the first thing is always find shelter. That rings true in our lives as well. In order for us to function, in order for us to live in life, in order for us to have meaningful relationships, there must be safety in the shelter of that relationship. I mean, we know that it's a basic human need. In order for me to be vulnerable with another human being, in order for me to trust someone else, in order for someone else to trust me, in order to live together, to, to forgive each other and build each other up, there must be safety in that relationship. How do I know it's true? Well, it's a basic human need, and also it's found in the Bible. Look at the Garden of Eden, the first couple. Before sin entered the world, it was a very safe relationship perfect communion and community and transparency and sharing together, sharing with each other and sharing with God, a beautiful and safe relationship where one could be known without fear of humiliation or shame, just be known together, naked and unashamed, as the Bible says. And then sin enters the picture, and then what happens? The safety is gone. Now they hide from each other. Now they're not going to be their true selves. First thing. Blame, justification, defense, def defending their heart, and even hiding from God. So where do we find this great shelter? We find it in our Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the rock of our salvation. And in Him, when we seek that shelter, then the blessings start to flow. Here are some of the blessings that come out of that. Verse 5, you will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrows that fly by the day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys the city. So we find our safety in Christ first. Then this famous verse in verse 7, a thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. These are the blessings that flow out of the safety in that relationship in which we have in Christ. And when we have that safety, when we recognize that and grow in that, now we have the ability to experience those deep promises that no man or no, no death or, de or pestilence can take away. So where do we find this rock? Where do we find this shelter? How do we find this assurance? We look to our Savior. Look in verse 9. We find assurance in His salvation. Verse 9 says, If you say, The Lord is my refuge, and you make the most high your dwelling, and no harm will overtake you, and no disaster will come to your tent. Who's He talking about here? He's talking about the Lord, our Savior. Our Savior is our prophet, our priest, our king. In fact, we, we serve a Savior. He's been described in those three ways. He's described as our great high priest. The one who sacrificed himself once as a, as a sacrifice for um, righteousness that we can be made righteous in him. And he sits down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says, He's a, He is a great high priest who understands everything that we have been through. He has experienced everything we have been through, yet that key phrase there at the last part of that verse, in verse 15, yet without sin. We find our assurance in the one who gives us salvation and one who has experienced everything that we have experienced. You know, we are drawn to people that have experienced what we have, who have walked in our shoes. Think about it. When I... When I I'm in relationship with someone or I start to get to know someone and I start to realize that they're speaking my emotional language. They understand my experience and story. I mean, they don't just hear me and you'll say, hey, how are you doing, Lance? But no, how are you doing, Lance? You know, they really want to know my past experience. I, For myself, I start to find myself drawn to that person because they, they understand where I've been. They've walked in my shoes. In 1978, there was a great uh, campaign slogan that came out 
especially in the state of Tennessee, and it was, come along. What does that mean? Well, in 1977, a man decided to run for, uh, for the governor of the state of Tennessee. And this man's name was Lamar Alexander. Now, Lamar Alexander had a lot of hurdles to cross to connect with the citizens of the state of Tennessee. He was a lawyer that graduated from New York University. He graduated from Vanderbilt University, kind of elite schools in that state, as they classify them. I don't know how you do that, but that's what they classify them as. So he had that barrier to cross. Politicians, like almost any time in our country, are not very popular people. And the governor that held the office before Lamar Alexander, uh, he was described as boldly corrupt. People had no trust for politicians. And so Lamar Alexander comes in almost as an outsider, and he has to find a way to connect with the tradesman that works in Knoxville, the junior high school teacher in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, the UPS driver in Jackson, you get the picture, uh, the truck driver in Goodlettsville, uh, the doctor that works up in Portland, Tennessee. I mean, how is he going to connect with these people? He has an idea. He decides in 1977 that he is going to walk across the state of Tennessee, literally walk across the state. So he starts in Kingsport, Tennessee, if you're familiar with that. It's one of the most eastern parts, eastern cities in Tennessee, and he decides to walk clear across the state to Memphis, Tennessee, to the Arkansas border. Now, if you're familiar with the ge geography of Tennessee, like me and my family are, you know that there, it's 450 miles from the Bristol area on Interstate 40 all the way to Memphis. I'll just say it. I think Aaron, Anthony Terranova knows the geography of Tennessee very well. Congratulations. I had to say that. I'm sorry. Okay. Back to the illustration. <laughs> Back to the illustration. He knows that geography very well. Well, so did Lamar Alexander. Uh, he did not walk 450 miles. He walked 1,022 miles across every major city, every, almost every small town he can come across. He went through Knoxville, Nashville, Jackson, Henderson, all the way to Memphis, connecting with people. I remember a, 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 seeing this commercial as a kid. Uh, we lived in Memphis. And I, there was one, I think a farmer, he was talking. He said, that snow is this high. I don't think the snow gets high, that high in Tennessee. Here he came, walking up. Lamar Alexander came up and said hello to me. What he, he had a red flannel checkered shirt. So he was not just trying to be one of the people. He actually like became one of the people walking through that whole state. Why? Because he's connecting. He's walking in people's towns and getting to know them. Okay. You get the picture. We serve a high priest. We serve one who has walked in our shoes, has walked in our town, who has lived our lives. He has experienced isolation, betrayal, physical calamity. He has been rejected. He has experienced the hopelessness, experienced shame, yet without sin. And there, in that man, in that high priest, we find our salvation. Now, as we find, our, we find the assurance of our salvation, we begin to experience what I would call the prosperity of his promises. Now, as we understand these promises, we need to understand two things. Number one, the nature of the promises, and that these promises, as we read in the last part of this psalm, have conditions to them. Well, let's look at these. First, let's look at the nature of these promises. It says in verse 11, For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift up their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Now, let me just stop right there for a second. Do those verses seem familiar to you? They do in this way. If you think about it, if you think about where you heard, that, especially this last phrase, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. This was quoted by the devil himself to our Lord in the temptations in Matthew, in the temptation of Christ in Matthew chapter four, specifically I think verse verse six. Remember, uh, Satan has brought uh, Christ up to the top of the temple. He says, "Throw himself down, because your angels will protect you." It says in the Scripture, does it not? No foot 
will strike against a stone? Now, how does Jesus counter that argument? Jesus counters Satan the way that he would counter our temptation to use that verse in this way as well. What Satan is saying is, these promises are for me and how I will use them. Use them as you will, Jesus. Because it says here that no, nothing will ever happen to you. But Jesus counters by Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16, and he says, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Other versions have, do not tempt the Lord your God. In other words, there's an invitation there to say, do not pretend to know the mind of God. These promises aren't meant to be used for just our own great living and, and, and benefit in this life, but an invitation to go deeper into the heart of God, to understand the heart of Christ and go deeper into that relationship in which we find our shelter and our assurance. We see this illustrated very clearly in the life of Job. When we use the life of Job as an example of, of understanding the nature of suffering uh, in, in in many instances. And so here we find that in the book of, like if you go through the book of Job, you see in the first couple of chapters there's Job pray, you know, praising God even in the midst of suffering. But then as we get into chapters 3 and 4, we find that Job is starting to even curse the day he was born. He has discussions with his friends who are helping him understand the meaning of these sufferings and that because God is just, Job, you have done something wrong. And there's great debate and discussion between Job and his friends and even Job's wife about what he has done wrong. And yet, throughout the book, Job is proclaiming his innocence. And he is, he's done nothing to deserve this suffering. And as the chapters go on, Job begins to question God. In fact, he asks God to show himself and show the meaning of these sufferings. And remember that at the end of that book, God does answer Job. But not in the way that Job would expect. See, he doesn't tell Job the meaning of his suffering, to why these sufferings are happening. But instead, God shows Job a picture of how he holds the universe together in his hands and how no human being can fathom the intricacies of the universe and God's sovereign plan, only that it is God's will that we become more like a son Christ. And after hearing this, Job, and after seeing this, Job becomes humbled and accepts his place in life and continues to grow closer in his relationship with God. And that is our invitation this year as we experience real prosperity in these promises. You know, this kind of ties in with Romans chapter 8, verse 28. For everything works together, for God causes everything to work together for good to those who love him and for those who are called according to his purpose. That doesn't mean that we're not afflicted by disease and setback and brokenness and betrayal and hurt and relationships and financial hardships and things that we struggle with even in, even in this year. Yet it's an invitation to understand even more deeply God's love for us. John Piper uses the word apprehend, to apprehend our salvation, and to apprehend the promises of God, to understand them, to willingly seize them and grasp them. And then we start to fully understand these promises start to take on a different meaning. Look at, the, look at these conditions described in verses 14 and 15. Conditions that are not merit-based. We don't do something to earn God's love. But they're grace-centered conditions. Look, because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him, and I will honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him, and I will show him my salvation. The condition is, is that we trust. We love God, and we call on his name, and we believe in him. And these promises start to take on a deeper, more powerful meaning. Now, with that trust and that love growing day by day, we don't fear disease. 
We don't fear financial loss. We don't fear job loss. We don't fear what man could do to us or what could happen in this life. Because every day it becomes more and more clear where our trust lies and where our, where our love lies. And we become more and more like Christ. And no one, no one, and nothing, nothing can take that away. And so this week, in fact, this year, we have no idea what this year will hold. But one thing is for certain, that on in Christ, we have the rock of our foundation. In Him, we have abundant promises. In Him, we have safety and shelter. In Him, we have assurance and salvation. In Him, we have true prosperity and the blessings that He showers on us each day because of His love, His salvation, and His forgiveness. Let's pray.